guys. Uh, just going to read the last bit of The Unforgotten Coat. Um, I'll probably go all the way to the end, we'll see if we get on. I'd been crashing through the nettles and broken bottles along the tracks for about five minutes when I heard the strange, high-pitched singing coming from the rails. I looked behind me. There was a blob of bright blue light hovering over the rails. A train was coming. I didn't think about it. I ran back to the platform and jumped on board the train. For five minutes, there was nothing outside the window but more houses and the rest of the flyover. Then, something flashed in the sun. A mountain of scrap metal, towering over the Seafarth dock. Shining in the hot afternoon sun. Metal mountains. After that came the fields. I had no idea till then how close our house was to cows and horses. How come no one had ever mentioned it? Maybe no one knew. Maybe I was discovering an unknown country that everyone had missed, even though it was so close by. After the fields came trees. I put the Polaroid of the Mongolian forest up against the window on the train as it clunked into Freshfield Station. They were the same trees. Definitely. So I got off. I walked up the road into the trees. Someone went by with a dog and smiled at me. Like it was fine for me to be there. A couple went past with a pushchair and massive wheels. They said hello. Then it was just trees and dark. Worrying shadows in among the trees and something. So, excuse me, sometimes scratching sounds. Though I could usually tell that it was just birds. And once I saw a squirrel. I was off the road now, following a sandy path. Every now and then there was a little white post with a number on it, which made me feel like I was going the right way for something, though I didn't really know what. That's the Polaroid. I where she's going. Then, all of a sudden, no guy was walking next to me. I didn't see it happen. I just sort of felt someone there and then saw him in the corner of my eye. Where's Chingis? I asked. Just coming. How come you got here before us? We thought we'd have to wait all night for you to catch up. I got the train. How? Oh. How did you know I was coming? You're a good guy, it's your job. We sat on a log, we waited for Chingis. Chingis didn't seem that surprised to see me either. Which way now? That's all he said. I was quite buzzed by the way they just expected me to be there in a the forest. No one else had ever expected me just to be in a forest for them. I liked being the good guy, so I said, this way, like I knew what I was doing, and carried on following the numbered posts. Although it looked like we were at the end of the world, I knew there was a train every 15 minutes that would take us back to Boople in 23 minutes. The whole thing reminded me of when a dream gets weird. And you're sort of scared, but you also somehow know that you can wake yourself up and you'll be in your own bed. So you carry on dreaming just a bit longer. That's what we did. We carried on, but walking. When we spotted a pile of logs and twigs up ahead, I pointed them, pointed at them like I'd arranged for them to be there and said, I thought you might want to make an ovu or something. Yeah, good idea. So the three of us piled the wood into a pyramid and Nergai went off and found a long branch to stick in at the top for a, plag for a flagpole. We tied my school jumper to it for a flag even though it was getting cold. And then Chingis opened his bag and pulled out a horse skull. <sighs> Where did you get that? From my granddad's horse. Right, well, obviously that would be in your school bag. He put the skull on top of the ovu. I said, are we going to walk around it now, three times in a clockwise direction? Yes, said Chingis. Which way is clockwise? I showed them, but Nergai was unconvinced. Anyway, he said, it all depends on the clock, doesn't it? I pointed out that all the clocks go the same way. Oh, of course they do, said Chingis. You're so stupid. So we agreed that all clocks went the same way, but none of us could agree which way that was. Even I wasn't sure, really. We've got a digital clock on our computer, so we went round what I thought was clockwise, and then we went round the other way, just in case. 
And then their guy started to worry that by going one way and then the other, we were undoing what we'd just done. And I said, we could make a fire, but it's illegal. I don't want to break the law, said their guy. We could dance, dancing's not illegal. Then they both stared at me. You're supposed to light a fire and then dance around it. They both stared at me even more. Then Chinggis said, let's move on then lads. So we moved on. And I explained to them that you could build a mental of you in your head if you wanted, put all your good memories in it and a mental flag on top. The trees grew thinner and we came to a field. It might have been a cornfield, some kind of long grass anyway. I said we definitely weren't supposed to walk through that. You could see that no one else had. But Chingis was dead keen. It will be fully, it will fully baffle that demon, he said. You walk next to me and their guy will walk beside me, so it looks like the tracks of two people, not three. It will sack him off completely. We trudged through the wide, through the waste hard grass. Frightened birds flew up around us, whistling and fleeting and beeping like little fax machines. The corn rustled like wrapping paper. Chingis pulled the Polar Polaroid camera out of his bag and took a picture of the tracks we left. I said, Chingis, where did you get that camera? Refugee project, summer holiday party in St Anne's, Overbridge Street. I want it in the Tombola. They had a bouncy castle too, said the guy. So that was this summer, here, in Liverpool. So you didn't have the camera when you were in Mongolia. So none of your photos are actually of Mongolia. Are you even from Mongolia? I didn't say any of that. Chingis shook the Polaroid dry and showed it to me. The funny thing was, it looked like Mongolia, as though he could turn bits of Liverpool into bits of Mongolia just by pointing his camera at them. We carried on making our way through the field until we came out the other side. Now it was just sand in front of us, all the way to the sky. The desert, said no guy. We're back in the desert where we belong, said Chingis. I said, I think this is the beach, to be honest. If it's the beach, where's the sea? Over there behind the dunes. Honestly, this is the desert. Welcome to our desert. And he took another picture and he turned the beach into the desert with his camera. He gave me this photo and the one of the cornfield. I made the boys slog up the dunes. The wind was throwing sand in our eyes and that really sharp grass was cutting my legs. I didn't care. I just wanted to know Excuse me, I just wanted to show them that the sea was there and that they were wrong. But when we got to the top of the dunes, there was no sea, nothing. Just miles and miles of sand and mud shining in the sun. See, said Chingis, the desert. I said, no, the tide's out. No tide goes that far out, said Chingis. <clears throat> what do you think they are? We scrambled down the other side of the dunes. They started to walk straight out towards the horizon. But the wind was blasting in now, and bit by bit we ended up following the line of the dunes. I pointed out that since the sand was wet and muddy, and there were shells and seaweed and starfish everywhere, this was clearly the sea. So where's it gone then? Maybe it's vanished. Maybe your demon made it vanish. That's what it does, isn't it? Makes things vanish. Will you stop talking about it? Don't you know? Don't you know it can hear you when you talk about it? If it does get us, it'll be your fault. If it does get you, I'll be fully surprised. Don't you know it's not real? People don't just vanish. A lot of people vanish. Practically everyone we know vanished. That's why we had to leave home, because people kept vanishing. It was windy on the beach, and I wish my jumper was being, wasn't being used as a prayer flag. There was no one around, and nothing seemed to be moving. I said, maybe we've already vanished. Maybe this is where you come when you vanish. You'll get used to vanishing, said Chingis, who seemed to think that you now own the beach. 
I was worried that the tide would come back in without us noticing the sweepers, sweepers all out to see. Also, the wind was cold, even though Chingy said it wasn't cold, and went on about how in Mongolia you knew when it was cold because there was frost and snow on the hump of your camel. I led them back to the dunes away from the wind and the possibility of sudden drowning. They never asked me where I was going or why. I was the guide, and they were following. The less we know, said Chingis, the less the demon can find out from us. There was a rough path made from logs laid out on the sand with gorse and nettles growing up in between the wood and on either side of the path. Poking out of the gorse, there were one or two of the numbered wooden posts. Without saying anything, I followed them to the top of a high dune where we stopped to look down. And for a minute, we didn't say anything, but they each grabbed one of my hands and squeezed it. Down beneath us, sheltered from the wind, was a cluster of plump Mongolian yurts. How did you do this? asked another guy. Are we home? Is this Mongolia? It definitely looked like Mongolia. I had no idea how I'd done it, but didn't want to admit it. I just said, let's see. I'll stop it there.